Hello, I'm Alec Avdekov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. A while back, in September of 2021, in the episode, Taking Stock of My Podcast, I said that one of my goals is to have experts in the historical field to be on my podcast. Well, on today's episode, I am so lucky to have Dr. Alexander Birds as our guest. He is currently the visiting professor at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. In 2021, he published and defended a dissertation on what life was like in the Prussian and British armies for the ordinary soldier. He also wrote an essay in and edited the book, The Changing Face of Old Regime Warfare. He is incredibly knowledgeable, and I am so excited that he decided to be on my podcast. The next voice you will hear is my own, introducing Dr. Alexander Burns. Take it away, Alec. Today on The Life and Times of Frederick the Great, we have a special guest on our show. Why don't you uh, introduce us to yourself and a little bit about the your experience in the military history of Frederick the Great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Alec. My name is Dr. Alexander Burns, and I am a visiting uh, assistant professor of history at Franciscan University of Steubenville, Ohio. I have been interested in the, the history of Frederick the Great and his army since I was, gosh, like 11 or 12 years old. I had a book growing up called The World of George Washington or George Washington's World. I can't remember the exact title. And the parts about George Washington were okay, but what really sparked my interest in Frederick the Great was the sections of that book that talked about Frederick the Great in his world, and I, I really thought it was fascinating. When I got a little bit older, I started reading, you know, Christopher Duffy's books, and again, that kind of you know sparked my interest in, in that that period of history. And I always tell my students, I mean, the the time in the middle of the 18th century, you know, specifically connected to Frederick the Great in the Seven Years' War. It's one of the most important periods in world history. It sets up the modern world in many ways. And, and some historians have made that exact claim that the Seven Years' War and maybe even Frederick the Great's role in it, is, it, some historians call it the father of the modern world. It sets up the American Revolution. It sets up the French Revolution. It gives the British control of India and Canada, both sort of the first and second British Empire. The, the groundwork is laid for the fall of the first British Empire and the rise of the second British Empire. It sets up the beginnings of dualism in German history, the, the great question of who will lead. You know, will Germany be a ethnic community that is is led by a Protestant North or a Catholic South, the center of the German world be in Vienna or be in Berlin. I mean, these are all questions that are raised by Frederick. And so, you know, this is a this is a really important period of world history and, and, and European history. And I think it's it's great that you're exploring this in, in a podcast, Alan. Oh, thank you very much. And, and I definitely agree with you. I think it was maybe uh, Winston Churchill who said that uh, the Seven Years' War was, one can argue, was the First World War. And I, I can definitely understand where he was coming from with that. So today we're mainly going to be talking about the military history of Frederick the Great's army, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, this is, this is something where I sort of specialize in in my academic research while I'm, I sort of teach American history at Franciscan University, and I'm, I'm very happy to do that because a lot of my graduate training was pointed towards that. As a result of some changing advisors, when I was completing my dissertation, I ended up writing my doctoral thesis on exactly that, the, the, the sort of army life in, in Frederick the Great's army, what it was like for ordinary soldiers, sort of their day-to-day -day experiences, things like this. All right. Well, I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that. One thing that I was fairly interested in is since we are right now at the end of the First Silesian War, beginning into the Second Silesian War, Frederick the Great managed to mobilize a massive amount of soldiers in a very short amount of time for that time period. So could you tell us a little bit about how Prussia and Frederick the Great raised so many soldiers 
and how it differs from modern conscription. Absolutely. So you have, from the time of Frederick's father, the later part of his reign, a system in Prussia called that we in English call the Canton system. And this is a very important kind of structure or system that that allows the Prussian government to make sort of limited draws of manpower on the, uh, you know, to, to recruit men into the army. Some historians looking at this have, have said it's the first example of modern conscription. I, I don't know what I think about that. I do think that if you look at other examples across the modern era, such as the uh, in Dellingsverket in Sweden or the Russian conscription system, it's a little bit more sophisticated than those. The Swedish system is based on you know a number for every number of houses or families you have to provide one soldier. For the uh, in the Russian system, you when you're recruited into the army, you're, you're basically serving for life. And so when you go to leave the army, you know the other villagers hold a funeral for you because they they know they're never going to see you again. The Prussian recruitment system is fascinating because I think in a lot of ways. It's like being conscripted into the reserves in America today. And so you would go into the army, you would be, you would, you sort of, your number would, would come up. And it's important to note that not, this is not the only way the Prussian army recruits. Indeed, the Prussian army probably recruits just as many, if not more men through voluntary enlistment as it does through conscription and the Canton system throughout the 18th century. But the Canton system is unique because it provides the Prussian state with two things. First of all, it provides the Prussian state with a number of men who have gone through what we would today call basic training. They've been in the military full-time for two years. And when that two years is over, they're sent back to their village communities. And so the Prussians continue to benefit from their economic output, their agricultural labor. They go home and they're able to sort of start families and, and sort of be there in their village communities as productive members of society. They're not just, you know, in, in sort of the enlightenment philosophical way of looking at it, they're not just sort of a waste of resources because they're in the army, that, you know, they, they're still, they're, you know, their economic potential is still being utilized by the state. With that said, these men have had two years of full-time military instruction and they're also every year they're called up for a you know a month to two month refresher course where that they are you know out on maneuvers with the army in in the spring or in the autumn so this is a a way for prussia to punch above its weight we might say the prussian military in 1740 is smaller compared to a lot of the great European powers like France or Austria, obviously. The Prussian population as a whole is only you know 2.25 or 2.5 million at this time. And so this is a way for a relatively large number of men to have military experience, to provide a, a resource or a military potential for the Prussian army while allowing them to stay economically productive, to continue to be in their village communities and participating in village life as well. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, especially when you compare Prussia to a state like France, where I, I would consider it a, a complete outnumbering of the Prussian population, just, just in terms of numbers. Yet Prussia seems to be able to win battle after battle, and the Kingdom of France at that time seems to just not be able to punch as well as uh, as Prussia is going to be able to. Yeah, I mean, certainly during the Seven Years' War, I mean, the French military does not put in a, a very powerful showing. I mean, but if you look at these these battles during the, the War of Austrian succession out in the out in the Netherlands, I mean, the the French under Maurice de Saxe have a lot of success fighting against the uh, the British military. And yeah, I mean, I, I think to some extent, as historians, we're always looking, military historians mostly, we're also always looking at these cycles of people who are getting victor's disease and, you know, who are resting on their laurels. And then if you lose, you're actually investing a lot in sort of reforming your military and making it more effective. And I guess I would say the 
the, the pr trouble the French run into is they have a really great showing in it tactically and operationally in the, the war of Austrian succession, but because they don't have a leader like Maurice de Saxe in the seven years war, uh, they're perhaps less effective as they might've been. Oh, that, that's very interesting. I, I especially like the uh, addition of the victory disease because you see it time and time again in history, whether it be a late Romans or, um, uh, the the prussians in 1806 but I, i'm curious how were other states raising soldiers such as austria or france or or even great britain yeah absolutely so so most of these states rely on a on a mix of what we might call you know conscription and voluntary enlistment i mean Throughout the entirety of the 18th century, and, and Christopher Duffy is, is pretty clear about this in, in military experience in the Age of Reason, the vast majority of soldiers are recruited into these armies through voluntary enlistment. So, so they decide to sign up. Uh, they're not you know, tricked into signing into the military. They're not voluntarily conscripted. The Russian military in the 18th century is the only state that relies on permanent conscription as its way of, of you know, sort of taking men into the, into the force. France and Britain, both in times of crisis, will use force to enlist men in the, into the military during the course of the American War of Independence. The British draw men into the military forcibly at a couple of points in that conflict. The Austrians, they will, especially by the middle of the, of the Seven Years' War, they, they will get fairly desperate. They'll do, do things like try to recruit prisoners of war into their military force. They never, d during the period of the First, Second, Third Silesian War, they never decide to adopt a Canton-style recruitment system. They eventually will by the, by the end of the century, during the reign of Joseph II, um, Maria Theresa's son. They'll adopt that Canton-style of recruitment system. They're really impressed by it, but... Connitz, the the sort of foreign minister and in some ways the prime minister of the Austrian state during the middle of the 18th century is always concerned about the social implications of the Canton system, about the way it's going to change the Austrian society and the Austrian military. So as a result, he's very resistant to trying to implement a Prussian style Canton system into Austria. Yeah, that's that's definitely really interesting. I, I... I guess I would have never thought of the social implications of, of a move such as that. Now, why do you think Frederick Wilhelm, uh, Frederick the Great's father, was able to uh, implement the Canton system so effectively back in his day? It's a really good question. I mean, I, I, I guess I would say from the time of, of the great elector up through Frederick William I, you, you have sort of the the height of Prussian absolutism. Um, I mean, by the time we get into Frederick the Great, we can maybe speak of, of enlightened absolutism and, and a, a lot of historians are, are having and have been having for a number of years sort of conversations about whether that's a helpful term. But I do think you know, qualitatively something different is going on. Frederick William is able to implement the Canton system because he's subordinated so much of the Prussian state to his own control. He doesn't have to worry you know, as much about the sort of machinery of governments fouling up or resisting what he wants to do. He's a famously difficult bureaucratic taskmaster. I, the story that always sticks out to me is he, he in some ways, he's sort of like the uh, originator of the working lunch. So when, when he's having meetings with his cabinet officials, a half of them will be allowed to eat while the other half have to stay working. And so it's, he's, he's, a, he's in some ways, he's, he's a fascinating and, and very kind of neurotic type of individual. He always gets, you have these, you know, all of these anecdotes about him that make him seem almost insane. I mean, you know, who would, who would go out and uh, steal tall people from across Europe to, to put in, in their military, right? It's just a weird thing to do. But I, I think it's important to, to say he, in a lot of ways, he was a very effective leader. He was he was good at consolidating authority un, under the, in the person of the monarch. He also and and Duffy, you know, uses this quote at several points throughout his writing. He in, later in life, he he sort of says, "People think I'm nuts because I 
and famously like you know really spend thrift and i have this weird like obsession for tall people but this is kind of like a front i would never have been allowed to amass a huge treasury and build a large and powerful army if people didn't think i was kind of weird and crazy and so I'm not sure if this if this is accurate if he if he's actually you know if these like weird obsessions he has maybe they are weird obsessions maybe they aren't but he like like Frederick I think this is a continuity between the the two monarchs which is important because often we only think about the ways that these two men are different he is very focused on Prussia's place in the world he's very focused on the idea that Prussia is a vulnerable state, it's a smaller state compared to many of its neighbors, it's a state that doesn't have the same natural resources or defensible boundaries as many of its neighbors. Uh, and so he's he's looking to solve that problem in the same way that Frederick is also is, uh, y- you know, maybe a little bit eccentric. I definitely tried to emphasize that in my podcast episodes. Uh, about Frederick the Great and uh, Frederick Wilhelm, and that despite people thinking that they're total polar opposites, they're both autocrats. They're both a whole bunch of important emphasis on the military. And well, if you look at Prussia's geography, it uh, it makes sense with it being right in the center of the North European plain. There's no natural boundaries that Prussia had at the time, especially with it being scattered. So I, I was just curious. Also, there was a uh, there was a quote that I got from a book uh, on uh, Maria Theresa, and one of the courtiers of Maria, Ther- Maria Theresa said that uh, don't worry, Frederick will just keep his gun loaded just like his father did. What do you think caused Frederick to uh, essentially fire the gun of, of invade Silesia, whereas Frederick Wilhelm wasn't? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think it's a, um, a difference in temperament between these two leaders. I think it's a, and let me sort of explain what I mean by that. So first of all, Frederick William, he's a figure who absolutely buys into the idea of the Holy Roman Empire. He buys into it because he thinks that as a territorial prince, he can use, you know, his his Landeshochheit and and Reichsunmittelbarkeit, his you know territorial sovereignty and his his uh, your sort of sense of immediate access to the emperor as a way of strengthening Prussia's position. He thinks by being a good and loyal sort of supporter of the emperor, that would be the best way to to ensure Prussia's security, to try and protect Prussia in a in a fairly dangerous world. He believes that you can, you can, if you buy into the system, things will pay off for you. And Frederick fundamentally doesn't really believe this. He absolutely, by the end of his reign, sees the value of the empire and sees the value of trying to use the machinery of the empire to sort of annoy Joseph II. But during the the first part of his reign, he doesn't see the benefit for Prussia in maintaining this subordinate and supportive relationship between Prussia and Brandenburg Prussia and the sort of the Austrian state and, and the person of the emperor. And so when Charles dies and you know Maria Theresa takes the throne, Frederick knows that there's going to be some sort of conflict. He does believe, I think, it, even if he does not make the decision to go out and attack Austrian territory, someone else will. And, and, and I think that he's probably right about that. Because I mean, if you look at the, the concert of powers that attacks Maria Theresa in 41, it's like Saxony, Bavaria, France, Prussia. I mean, it's this huge, it's, I mean, it's amazing that... Uh, Maria Theresa manages to preserve the her patrimony to the extent that that she does, and I think to a large degree, it's a shame that Maria Theresa is so fully overshadowed 
uh, by Frederick. I mean, in some the ways is I think she might be one of the greatest monarchs or even one of the greatest strategists of the 18th century. Uh, certainly she took uh, an absolutely prominent role in directing and, and creating her military force, just like, just like Frederick did with his. Now, unfortunately, you know, uh, she's not able to go out and command it in person as a result of kind of the, the gender norms of the 18th century. But she absolutely does, you know, take this personal interest in her, in her force. So when Charles dies, I, I think I, I often have, have sort of wondered to myself, if, suppose Frederick William had survived another two years, another, another three years, would he have done the same thing Frederick did? I, I don't think that probably he would have, you know, I, I tend to think that he is someone who, who sees the benefit in trying to work within the system of the empire. And Frederick, maybe as a result of his upbringing, maybe as a result of the role that the Austrians uh, ambassadors have, have taken in uh, breaking up the English marriage, in, in breaking up, in sort of supporting you know, his, his father's treatment of him, maybe he makes a different decision that his father would, than his father would have. But yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, to some extent, I do just think for all of Charles's efforts with the pragmatic sanction, it's an incredibly naive policy. And someone, whether or not it's Frederick, so many people around Austria have a loaded gun and there's going to be some sort of major conflict upon Charles's death. I think probably whether or not Frederick pulls the trigger. Um, I, I mean, I, I sincerely do think we still get some sort of war of Austrian succession, regardless of whether or not Frederick invades Silesia. Maybe he's fighting Saxony, you know, if Saxony joins the French or something like this. To some extent, though, I, I do think Frederick does this as a way of not necessarily trying to permanently antagonize himself to the Austrians, but as a way of securing Prussia's status against other medium-sized German states. I mean, imagine a world in which Saxony had taken Silesia. Um, that would permanently have connected the Saxons to their kind of, you know, territorially, they now have access to Poland, right? Um, and the Wetton dynasty has been on the throne of Poland since 1697. And, and so maybe that solidifies the, the connection between these two states. Yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating question. I... I don't think Frederick is trying to get, you know, necessarily personal revenge on the Austrians. But I, I do think fundamentally he's someone who, unlike his father, doesn't buy into the Holy Roman Empire at, at as much, or at least is not bought into it as much at this point in his reign. And furthermore, has a very careful kind of measurement of where, what's Prussia's relation, not just to Austria, but also to these other kind of middle states like Bavaria, like Saxony within the, the empire uh, that he thinks Prussia needs to exceed them in, in status and exceed them in, in sort of power. All right. Well, I, I definitely agree with you on, on the few points you, you said, especially about Maria Theresa. I think even though the great has been thrown out so many times in history at that point in time. If Frederick is considered the great, might as well have Maria Therese to be great too. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree with you there. Yeah. I know I threw a curveball on you. This necessarily wasn't what we were supposed to be talking about, but I just thought that question was too, uh, too interesting to pass up. But going way back to uh, the military history of things, we talked about the uh, overriding political forces that led Frederick into conflict. What was it like for the ordinary person? What was it like for the ordinary soldier in Frederick the Great's army, whether on campaign or whether in battle? Yeah, absolutely. No, this is a this is a question that I spent a lot of time thinking about, and something I, I looked at a lot in my dissertation, uh, which which I I completed a couple of years back. So first of all, I would say almost more than any other topic uh, in the 18th century, there are a lot of myths when it concerns ordinary soldiers and and what motivated them, you know, sort of their, their experiences. In the early part of the 20th century, there was a 
British historian and uh, it was sort of writing about Frederick's army. And famously, he said, I'll just paraphrase the quote because I, I, I can't recall it exactly, but essentially there has, has never been a more stupid soldier than, than the soldiers who fought for Frederick the Great. The, maybe they're the dumbest soldiers in all of world history. And the, the amount of... I, I don't know, that, that quote really grinds my gears in a lot of ways. But the, the, just the amount of pride and hubris it takes to look at an entire class of people and say, oh, these people are all idiots. But that's something that's so unhelpful as, you know, as a historian, right? That's something that's so unhelpful in trying to actually understand the past as it actually occurred. So, first of all, when compared to other armies of this time, the Prussian army has a surprisingly high number of literate people in its ranks. They are corresponding with their families in, in relatively large numbers. And this is, this is a story that I looked at a lot in my dissertation, the idea of this like letter writing that goes on between Prussian soldiers and their, and their communities. But I, I think it's important, before, before I talk about that, just to kind of pause and, and talk about the native Prussians, the guys who are actually not, not the ones who are being recruited from all over the empire, not like the French or Italian guys who are signed up and, and fighting in, in part, Frederick's military, but actually the native Brandenburgers and, and Prussians that are in, uh, in Frederick's army. These men grow up in a pretty rural environment. They grow up in sort of a village community, probably probably a village that has less than 500 people or fewer than 500 people in it. A village environment where there's a large kin or extended family sort of network where they're, where they're sort of a known quantity. And so you often find these men have really strong connections to their extended family, to their to their village community. And we can see this in the letters of two Prussian soldiers uh, who fought in the the 13th, sometimes it's called the Itzenplitz Regiment because of, of its chef or, or commandant during the, the Seven Years' War. These letters were actually found pretty fr- recently. Some workmen were moving boxes in an attic about 20 miles north of Berlin. And they found a collection of approximately 20 letters from these common soldiers to their village community from, from the period of the, not, not just the Seven Years' War, but, but also going back into the, into the 1740s. So these, the, the family is the Zonda family, and it's both, both an uncle and a nephew both are in the same regiment. They, they so so they have. A, I think it's it's important sort of a family connection. They're actually at the front, right? Like they they're family members. They're you know alongside them in in the military. But they also have this really strong connection back home, and they're always writing these letters. Not just like, hey, mom, you know, this is what's happening to me at the front line. You know, I, I hope things are going well there. If you read these letters, they're desperate requests for information. And so they'll say, you know, like, how is Herr Michaelis? I mean, he, yeah, he was sick the last time you wrote us. He's, he's still doing okay. How is our pastor? What is he What is he preaching on, you know, this uh, this Sunday? You know, what, what what's... They really want to know what li- what life is like and what's going on back home. They are absolutely focused on maintaining this connection. And one of the things that's so interesting about this is even for the soldiers who can't write, they can still keep this, this sort of connection to home and family alive with by essentially going to a man from their village who is literate and saying, hey... Can you, in your next letter home, can you, you know, send a message to my wife and ask her how she, she and the kids are doing? And so there are letters, a specific letter that I, I looked at in the in the the Prussian sort of secret state archives in in Dalam, where the soldier writes his his normal letter home to his wife, and then there are like eight PSs. There are like eight just sort of messages after the main body body of the letter ends which basically says, hey, this soldier in the regiment who's from my same village, he wants to know this, you know, how is, how is his cow doing? And, and this soldier, you know, wants to know, uh, he has not got, gotten a letter from his wife in like six months. Is she okay? Like, what's going on? And so you get the sense that these, these soldiers, first of all, it allows you to really understand them as, as people and not just sort of like in the historical abstract, 
um, you know, focusing like on their weapons or their uniforms, but like they were actually people with like emotions and desires, you know, like we have today. And then more importantly, it'll, it shows the way that like the village as an institution goes with the army or goes to the army and, and sort of goes with the army on campaign. So, so I, I guess I would say, you know, as far as what historians are working on with, with these common soldiers, trying to understand what their lives were actually like. A lot of historians today would say, not say like that British guy did, you know, a hundred years ago. And these guys are really dumb. These guys, you know, they don't have a lot going on mentally. Instead, we would look at the ways that these men are really emotionally invested in their local communities. And a lot of historians, people who are really writing about Scotland, like soldiers' motivations, like Sasha and Katrin Mubius, some phenomenal historians, Frederick's Army, like Ilya Berkovich, a great historian of common soldiers in the 18th century, uh, and to a lesser extent, sort of me in, in, in my writing, we would say, man, these men, they are stained by their, their sense of loyalty to their local community. They are fighting for their homes and their families, and they're reminded of, you know, the importance of this fight through this sort of correspondence that goes on with their with their families at home. So with that said, let me talk a little bit about what it was actually like to be a soldier. By our modern standards of life in 2022, it was really kind of horrible, right? I mean, it was, it was, it stunk in a lot of ways. I mean, it, it, physically, it's incredibly demanding. Another sort of memoirist from the 13th Regiment, Ulrich Breaker, who's actually Swiss and he's kind of dragooned into the Prussian army. He writes a lot about how it's physically demanding. You're carrying like a 60 pound pack and you're marching for, I, I mean, based on my research, something like 18 to 20 miles a day. I mean, this is, this is really a sort of fairly physically intensive, especially for men who aren't getting always a great level of caloric intake while they're on campaign. If you look at the sort of recollections of a particular soldier who fought um, in the Zorndorf campaign, uh, Gemeine Hoppe, he writes a lot about the way that you're always lying under arms. So like, you're not usually like, you know, in, in, unless the army is parked basically for a couple of months, you don't have things like your tent with you, you're lying on the ground. The uh, soldiers who are sort of on campaign in the very, the very first moment of the Seven Years' War, right before the Battle of Lobositz, are also talking about the way that, you know, we don't have tents, we don't have blankets. Basically, we have like things like our tornister, like our, you know, our our backpack basically is is like our, our pillow and that's really all we have. Those same soldiers from IR-13, the, the Itzenplitz Regiment during the Seven Years' War anyway, they write about how, man, we were laid out all night and it rained and, you know, one of these, you know, the, the nephew was writing home saying, man, you know, because it rained all night and we were out in the open, I was so stiff when we got up, you know, you, you just get a sense that it really was kind of rough to be a soldier in, in you know, and even divorced from like the danger of being in combat. It, it was physically demanding. It was something that took a pretty hard toll on these men. So on campaign, you know, life was, life was fairly, fairly difficult. Breaker talks about how a lot of the older soldiers in his regiment in the, in the opening marches of the Seven Years' War, they're unable to physically keep up with the army. They're, they sort of fall out uh, on the march. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that the sense that you get from these, uh, and, and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, we we're just talking about like myths about linear warfare, but the sense that you get from the 18th century is that it was kind of like, again, this is the myth, right? That it was a bright and colorful period in military history with a lot of flags and colorful uniforms. The guys all march to the beating of the drum and it's really sort of a, a pretty and aesthetically pleasing time. But if you actually kind of dig deeper than that and look at the reality of this, I mean, it's a period of warfare where soldiers suffer just like any other. It's a period of warfare where the men are being asked to endure physical hardship in ways that are pretty horrific and physically demanding. It's never an easy thing to, to be a soldier throughout most of human history. And you can kind of see that if you actually look at the correspondence of these men. Uh, I 100% agree. That's that's one of the things I try to emphasize on this podcast, that war is chaos. And it's essentially humans killing other humans. And there's nothing really romantic about it. Sure, you may have the paintings and the, the exhilaration of conflict. But all in all, it's just 
men killing other men. Going to the myths of linear warfare, I, I was definitely a curious as, as a young kid understanding why would armies just fight alongside each other in lines? It, it seems in a modern perspective, very counterintuitive, but definitely by the perspective of the times, it made the most sense. Uh, could you explain uh, why that is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so let me let me talk about some of the, the myths that connect to linear warfare, and, and then I'll, I'll sort of focus on why armies of the time used tactics like this. So, like, first of all, I, I, again, sort of like I was just saying, I think often the popular perception or stereotype of linear warfare as you know, it's, it's a time where the flags are flying and the drums are beating and the guys are all marching in step. And this is something that I think bears little resemblance to what, what the fighting was like on the battlefields. I mean, if you read Ulrich Breaker's account of the Battle of the Lobositz in, in 1756, it's really chaotic. And he, you know, he talks about the process of, of assaulting up a hill the the Prussian army is is you know really running low on ammunition in the course of this fight. I mean it's it's very it's very chaotic. Okay, so first of all, fighting in the 18th century, if you if you look at the Patriot, it looks like they're lined up like 20 feet away from each other, like shooting at very close range. That usually didn't happen. If you look at this this period of warfare, often soldiers are firing at each other from between 100 yards and 300 yards away from each other. So if we're looking at firefights, not guys going into attack with a bayonet, but if you're looking at firefights, it's usually happening at a fairly long range. And that sort of distances and range is made all the more challenging to actually try and hit your target by the amount of smoke that's being produced by these weapons. So Again, if you're thinking about linear warfare, don't probably think about like what it looks like in the Patriots. Think about groups of soldiers firing at each other from maybe two or three American football fields away from each other, and that most of that that football field is full of smoke because you know the, 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 the if you think about it, I mean men firing weapons two or three times a minute for ten minutes at a stretch, it's going to produce an enormous volume of smoke and. I mean, if you're if you're interested in seeing what this looked like, there are some some videos of the 2015 like 200th anniversary Battle of Waterloo reenactment, which is pr it's pretty small, you know, in, in terms of an actual 18th century battle. Um, you know, there are, there are only I think uh, maybe 10,000 reenactors in the field, so it's a very very small battle, even by 18th century terms, to say nothing of Napoleonic terms. But the amount of smoke being produced by these weapons is absolutely enormous, and initially it produces sort of a cloud of smoke in front of the unit that's firing. But after a while, just the entire battlefield is, is pretty pretty covered in, in smoke. And so it's very difficult to, to sort of hit hit anything or, or sort of pick out what you're firing at, except maybe if you see the muzzle flashes of the enemy who are firing back at you. So just, just visually what it looked like. Longer range, a lot of smoke. These men are also not terribly concerned with keeping up parade ground level discipline on the battlefield. There's a phenomenal description of the Battle of Prague from a junior Prussian officer who talks about the difficulty in, in maneuvering his unit, and he, he quickly realizes that the battle line is going to form up and his unit is going to be essentially missing, and so there's going to be a hole in the center of the line. And so he says to his men, okay, we've got to like run to get to get where we're going on time. We can't, we can't sort of stay, you know, kind of marching in, in close order. We've, we've got to just run and get to where we need to be. Otherwise it's going to be a huge, a huge sort of gap in the line. And so he talks about the regiment sort of literally running past this village and they do get to where they need to be. And he's kind of sheepish about this. He, he literally says, yeah, the regiment was not in perfect order. So he's, he's very embarrassed. But, you know, when it, it, when push comes to shove, if the options are do something that's tactically horrible or actually, you know, get to where you need to need to go, the, they choose to do what's tactically correct and not what's sort of formal, right? So this is, this is again, getting to the kind of the realities of linear warfare. I mean, these men were focused on trying to survive, trying to, trying to win. The Prussian military uh, frequently 
sort of did things just like this. Observing the Prussian military in the 1780s, the sort of Scottish officer Dundas says, Frederick doesn't like his troops to run on the battlefield all the time when you're maybe deploying to the attack or when you're sort of like moving forward to the attack. He says the, the men will lengthen their steps. So this is, he's, he's trying to say essentially things happen a bit faster uh, in actual combat uh, than they might on, on the drill square. No, I think that's really very, very interesting because uh, if you go back to the Battle of Molvitz, I, I looked at Duffy's account of the battle and it talked about how slow Frederick was in deploying the actual army. And it was the Austrian cavalry that was able to exploit that weakness at the beginning. So do you think that maybe that in that particular battle, it was Frederick's over-reliance on going by the books instead of what actually worked, that almost decided the battle. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I think, and I know you're covering this in the podcast, but I think the First Silesian War is a really interesting test case for the Prussian military because you have a situation where an army that has basically not fought in a major conflict for almost 20 years is being asked to go out and fight. And so in battles like Malvitz, you have a situation where soldiers don't really have a conception for what combat actually looks like. They don't have a they don't have that lived experience that can inform them, and so they are doing things sort of by the book. So, so example for at Malwitz, the Prussians open fire at like eight hundred yards, and and that's an incredibly far distance. You're not going to hit anything at 800 yards. I mean, it's ridiculous. But they don't have a good sense for what they should do. And so they're making, they're making sort of basic mistakes. And so, so yeah, it's, it's it really, it's really quite something. And, and Frederick, especially in response to that battle, gets after his men to hold their fire into very close range. And then, you know, for after that, he, he during the like the Second Silesian War and, and the period in between that and, and the beginning of the Seven Years' War, he switches to almost an anti-firepower doctrine where he says, no, we're just going to go up and try and attack the enemy with, with cold steel. You know, we're not going to we're not going to rely on firepower at all. And, and that doesn't work out terribly well in Seven Years' War for a lot of reasons. Uh, and he quickly sort of transitions back to uh, sort of a firepower-based uh, sort of doctrine. All of this to say, yeah, in the First Silesian War, the Prussian military is very much sort of working out the kinks. They're working out the, the sort of flaws in the system. They're, they're, they're ha- trying to like recover, essentially, from the, the years of, of peace where they have no formulation for doing what might actually... Where they have no sort of basis line for understanding of what a combat might actually look like, and so they're just going by the book. And by the time you get to the, the Seven Years' War, or even the Second Silesian War, you have officers who have been in combat mul- multiple times, and they, and they sort of know what it, they actually need to do in order to win these battles. Yeah, I, I find a, a little bit of historical parallels between the 20 years of peace from Frederick Wilhelm's reign to the 20 years of peace after Frederick the Great's reign and on to 1806. There was a degradation of military institutions where... They didn't have practical experience on uh, military goings on. So maybe that's why they underperformed at the very beginning of the wars. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that this lack of, of actual expertise and that you know, it's something that the Prussian army recovers from fairly quickly. Uh, it's something that, I mean, at, at this point, it's not so much that like, the higher level generals don't have expertise, like Schwerin, for example. He he fought in in a number of conflicts earlier in the 18th century. Or like Anhalt uh, Anhalt Dessau, the, the old Dessau. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Yeah, I mean he's he's you know he has this big big run in the in the War of the Spanish Succession, right? But it's it's there there is a difference between like having it's almost like a situation like World War Two, where you have generals who fought in World War One. But most of the lieutenants and captains and majors and all the enlisted men have never fought in a war before. And so there's, there's a gulf between the theory of war and what actually, you know, sort of war looks like. Uh, and the Prussian army has to kind of overcome this. All right. Well, that, that's very interesting. So one final question uh, as far as the, as the academic sense. I want this to be an opinion piece because uh, I want this to end up in a, in a sort of high note. 
So what do you think makes the army of Frederick the Great so unique in history? Yeah, absolutely. I think th- there's there's so many so many ways you can answer this question. I think people love the army of Frederick the Great because it's a story that resonates down to the present day. I mean, it's a, it's a smaller army that consistently is able to beat opponents who outnumber it. It's an army that is is tactically excellent, which is is something that sort of military enthusiasts and war gamers and and reenactors all really love to kind of kind of focus on. I think in the period itself. What made the army of Frederick the Great so unique was this odd marriage of being an army that was obsessed with with sort of spit and polish and a focus on getting the sort of the tactical minutia right and, and drilling the men so they would fire quickly and things like this with the idea that it was a highly motivated, in, in some ways, almost like a, a citizen army. And, and that's, I, I don't use that phrase loosely. This is actually something that that Frederick says, he, he describes his men as citizen soldiers. Literally in French, he says soldats citoyens, which is is odd from our perspective today. Because if you, you were to ask, say, the, the U.S. military today, identify some citizen soldiers in, in, in world history, probably the Army of Frederick the Great is not the one they would pick, right? I mean, our perception of them is these guys are all you know, like from Barry Lyndon, right? You know, they're all, you know, tricked into coming to fight and they're, you know, they're there against their will and they're not having a good time and, you know, they're ruled by this authoritarian king. It's really kind of a horrible, horrible time. But for these men who actually are in the Canton system, for these men who are there, who are native Prussians, uh, it is in a lot of ways like a like an army. Uh, it's certainly a native army. It's an army of of men who are defending in in their mind, even if they're not actually on the defensive, their homeland. They're very loyal to their families. They're very loyal to the king, and so this might seem counterintuitive, but I I think. Frederick's military genius certainly goes a long way to making the army unique, but I actually think probably the most decisive factor in in the the success that the Prussians enjoy is this sense of motivation or this sense of loyalty that the ordinary Prussian soldier feels for his army, feels for his, his unit, feels for his local community, and also, you know, certainly feels for the king. You have this ideology uh, that and and Catherine and Sasha movies have written a lot about this that sweeps the Prussian military in in the course of the Seven Years War that is sort of God and the king you know we're loyal to we're loyal to God we're loyal to the king a Prussian soldier ends his letter home to, to his family in 1762 Gott und Friedrich liebet nach like these these God and Frederick they both still live so there is just this sense of kind of loyalty and, and sort of long-suffering devotion on the part of ordinary Prussian soldiers that I think allows the Prussian army to be very effective in this time. And, and I think certainly this is what makes it unique. All right. Wow. Ah, thank you so much for that analysis. I, uh, I Thank you so much as well for your time. Absolutely. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. On At the end of episodes, I usually like to add in like little different foreign uh language pieces or interesting uh, anecdotes or little piece of advice so what is your piece of advice or a little foreign anic- uh, foreign language anecdote that you like to uh, conclude today's episode with yeah so i i guess i would say as a historian i would love to encourage you and and everyone listening to this podcast to try and understand the past uh, wie eigentlich gewesen, which essentially means as it actually occurred or, or as it actually happened. There are a lot of things that impede our understanding of Frederick's army and, and Frederick's time. But by diving into to primary source work, by, by sort of never thinking you have the whole picture, by continually trying to, to challenge your own understanding of, of this wonderful and fascinating period of history, we can get a slightly better understanding of maybe how it actually was, how what actually happened. And 
I, I think as a historian, this is something that th- there's a great gulf between like, you know, the meme, it's like what, what your mom thinks you do versus what you actually do. I think a lot of people look at historians and they, and they say, well, it's your job to like, remember everything that happened. And really a very small part of, of our, our day-to-day work as historians goes into trying to like remember facts, right? Instead, we're always searching for sources. We're always searching for interpretations that will allow us to reconstruct the past as it actually occurred and allow us to get a slightly better window into that the fascinating uh, life and times of Frederick the Great. Well, thank you so much. And uh, to all those out there, I appreciate you listening to us and um, see you later. Thank you so much for an awesome time. In the fight for understanding what actually happened in history compared to all the myths, I can definitely say that you, Dr. Burns, are helping to win the fight for truth and reality. Dr. Alexander Burns also has a blog where he posts about 18th century history and it's called Kabinetskriege. If you ever want to go more into depth about this time period, please go check it out. The link is in the show notes below. Also in the show notes is my social media. If you want to support the show even more, go to my Patreon where you will receive ad-free episodes as well as a future episode only on Patreon about the uh, upbringing of Frederick the Great's sister, Wilhelmina. Well, to conclude today's episode, we'll use the words of Dr. Alexander Burns. Let's remember to study history wie es eigentlich gewesen.